Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for coming and for having me, to Sally. I'm so excited to be here today. Like she said, I teach, so this is teaching, another teaching experience for me. And improvising is nice, too, because one rule of thumb is if you ever give any kind of presentation in any, in any setting, never rely on technology because it's a wonderful thing. But sometimes it doesn't work first. It's not there when you think it is. So that is something to think about. I want to start, today is about nonverbal communication, of course, but I want to start off with you, bless you. I want to tell you guys to not communicate with me or anybody else. So whatever you think that is, do it for a couple of seconds. So do not communicate with anybody. What would you do if I told you do not communicate? I'll give you a couple of seconds. Right. So a lot. Of, some of you closed your eyes. Some of you looked away. Some of you. Sometimes I get people that turn their chair all the way around, so they're literally they're, they can't look at me. That is interesting because all of your guys' definitions of, of communication are correct. There's not one definition, like one set definition of what communication is or what nonverbal communication is. Nonverbal communication is just. Any message that you're sending that you're doing non-verbally with your body. So if you close your eyes, you're still communicating to me that you are not, you're, you might not be interested in me, or you're not one, you don't want to talk to me. If you, some of you did this, it's still the same thing, you don't want to talk to me. Sometimes some of you look down. When I'm teaching, if my students are looking around, looking down, doing whatever, they're communicating to me that they don't, they're not interested, they don't want to listen, they would rather be doing something else, whatever. So you're always communicating something. You cannot not communicate. And that's what today is for. You cannot not communicate. You're always communicating something, whether you think you are not or what. Sometimes when I ask my students this, they say, well, uh, when I'm sleeping, I'm not communicating anything to you. Okay, I guess you're not communicating, but you'd still be communicating that you don't want to have a discussion because you are sleeping. So I guess if you want to be that literal, it's still you can't, you're not communicating. So I want to show you guys this quickly. This is what I teach my public speak. I taught I teach many communication classes at Eastern and Washtenaw, uh, nonverbal communication, small group, listening, gender, intercultural, if I can remember that well. Interpersonal, public speaking, I'm not said that. So this is what I teach in my public speaking today. You write this down or not, but it's gonna give you an understanding of the nonverbal communication interaction. So you always admire my drawings. You always have a speaker, and you always have a listener. Always, that's obvious. You can think about this when you are mediating, when you're doing with clients, when you're talking to friends, whatever. Always a speaker and a listener. The speaker encodes a message, and encoding means that they're sending some kind of message. Right? The listener decodes a message, and that means that they're interpreting that message in some way. This is where we get in trouble sometimes, based on our verbal communication or nonverbal communication, because it's very ambiguous. I can say something to you, and you can take it very different than what I intended it to be. So that's the difference between encoding and decoding. If I ask you whose responsibility is it to get a mess to either underst to understand the message effectively or to get a message across, whose responsibility is it, the speaker or the listener? Both. 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 I agree with that. If you were to pick one, I would say it's mostly the speaker because. And sometimes I get well the listener because if they don't understand the message, they must not have been listening well enough. But it's the speaker's responsibility because it's you're the one speaking. So you need to be able to convey that message the way you understand it. So if you need to re-explain yourself multiple times, re-explain yourself multiple times. You've got feedback. And this is where nonverbal communication uh, comes into play. The speaker sends feedback and the listener sends feedback. So if I were to teach, if I were teaching you in class, like maybe today, um, my nonverbal communication is saying something. How many of you have been in a class, seminar, whatever, where the speaker is monotone? 
or yeah. they're reading those PowerPoint or whatever they have constantly the whole time. What is that conveying to you guys as the audience? Not interested in you? What else? Anything else? Security? Anything else? Then they'd be bored with what they're doing. Yeah, all that stuff is true. And if they're bored with what they're doing, why should you care about what they're saying? So that's, that's tough. So the speaker is conveying a message to you based on the way they are presenting their information. Are they bored? Are they excited? Are they passionate about what they're doing? You guys are all sending a message to me as well. Are you giving me eye contact? Are you looking around? Are you on your phone? Are you just falling asleep? Whatever. All that stuff is conveying a message to me of whether or not you are interested in what I'm saying. So even though it's not verbal, it's not verbal. So there's much more to this, but this is mostly I guess this is where we'll stop for today. But that's the basic transactional model that we talked about. Okay. So another thing that I want you to remember is that we can only control our own communication and behavior. So often we're mediating or we're talking to a friend or a client or a coworker and we want so bad to fix them. It's not being so rude. Stop being so lazy. Just talk to me effectively. Stop doing whatever you're doing wrong. But we can't fix them. But we can't stop them. So if you are having a con if you're in a conflict with one of your coworkers or clients, you can only control your own communication. So if you are communicating effectively, um, that's all you can ask for. Sometimes I tell my interpersonal students sometimes that. You can only control yourself, and they're like, well, I, would, I think I can fix my fiance. If we just get married, he'll change. And I say, oh, honey. It gets worse once you get married, so to you, that's not something that you should think. But we think that. We think that we can change somebody just because of them, with them being with us somehow. Maybe we'll influence them somehow. But if they change, it's their decision. It's not because of you. It's becoming them. So you can only control yourself. So that's why I'm here today to help you guys be better, better mediators, to control your body language a little bit. And I'm not saying I'm sure you guys are all fine with that, but just to be a little bit more aware of what you what you look like, I guess, when you speak. Nonverbal communication by definition. So this is where we're on your slides. The process of one person or people persons. Stimulating meaning in the mind of another person through nonverbal communication. So the types of nonverbal communication, you might not realize that some of these are fall under nonverbal communication. Physical appearance, obvious, the way we dress. I would never come to something like this or to teach my class and not do something with myself. I would never not put makeup on or not do my hair because I think that is a Huge, it says a lot about who I am. Do I care about what I'm doing? Yes. So I probably want to look a little bit presentable, right? So your physical appearance, uh, the way you dress, says a lot. Gestures and movement, obviously, that's part of nonverbal communication. We're going to talk more about that. Face and eye behavior, there is so much to this, but one thing that I can remember is there's like eight different things that you can do with just your eyebrows. And then there's eight different things that you can do with just your eyeballs. And then there's like eight plus things you can do with your mouth. It's insane. So it's important to be aware. And you can't be aware of every single tiny thing because we've got micro expressions. And if you've watched the show Lie to Me before, I think it's off the, off the air now, but they were talking about nonverbal communication and micro expressions and things like that. Micro expressions are the tiny split second things that you do with your face that nobody really notices unless you're trained to notice them. But you still do them. And somebody might pick up on them, who knows? So that's why you want to be really careful with what you look like. Vocal behavior is something that is also nonverbal communication. And you really have to be, this is probably one of the most important things with mediating. Because if we say, we're listening to one party and we're uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, mm-hmm. And then we listen to the other party, and we, you know we all have opinions and stuff, we just have to keep them to ourselves. We listen to the other person, and we're like, oh, really? <laughs> oh, that's a problem, because you're not being neutral. So that's 
called para-language. It's how you say something is more important than what you say. And you can probably relate to that in a lot of situations, even with your personal relationships. How you say something is much more important than what you say. All of this stuff can be intentional or unintentional, but they say nonverbal communication is much more true than verbal communication because we can say whatever we want to say and not really mean it. But it's really hard to hide how we're feeling on our face or on our body. So nonverbal communication is much more true than your verbal communication. Space, I have a video to show you, but we can't watch that today. It's on your last slide though, so if you want to watch it at home, you can feel free. It's an excellent TED talk, and it'll tell you a lot about uh, body language, but space, that video says that it's cultural and it's gender related. So guys tend to spread out more, just in general. You guys are good, pretty good. But in general, you might see, if you like, if you like to people watch, guys will spread out more. Girl, ladies will maybe like close in a little bit more. That space says a lot. If you spread out a little bit more, it shows that you might be a little bit more dominant or you're trying to communicate a little bit more dominance than others. Touch is nonverbal communication. Sometimes I'm a hugger, so if you hug, if, I, if you don't really know me, if Elle hugged me, I mean, I know him a little bit, but if he hugged me, it wouldn't be weird. I'd be like, oh, yeah, let's hug. Some people are not huggers at all. Don't touch me. Don't get in my bubble. The bubble's like way up here. <laughs> Do not get close to me. Touches, also nonverbal communication, says a lot. Environment is how you decorate your house, maybe. It says a lot about you. Do you have a lot of pictures of maybe family? Or do you have bright colors, bold colors? Do you have more light colors? Um, what does your car look like? Is it very clean or is it not so clean? That says a lot about you. Might just mean that you're busy and that's why your car is dirty. I'm not judging. I'm just saying that it says something about you. And then time is also part of nonverbal communication. And when I first taught this, well, when I first went into communication, I didn't really realize that time was a part of nonverbal communication. But if you are early on time or late, that says a lot about I'm a late person. And I'm sure people think that that's rude, and I will, I'll, I'll admit it. It's rude, to be, it's rude to be late sometimes. But that's just, I don't know, somehow I just cannot be on time in most things. Does it say something about me? Probably that I wait until the very last millisecond to get out of bed because I hate being a morning person. I can't be a morning person. That could be, so I have that more pro other priorities, I guess. Like anybody else not a morning person? Mm -hmm. Anyone understand me? Yeah, it doesn't mean that you're, you're meaning or trying to be rude, it's just other people's perceptions of you. So time says a lot. If you know of somebody else who really values time, would you, if you're a late person and they're really on time or early, and it's maybe a boss or <laughs> somebody really important, are you going to try your best to be there a little bit earlier than what you usually would be? Yeah. Yeah, because you know that other person. So you don't need to adapt. You know what you're talking to as well. Questions so far on what nonverbal communication cons uh, consists of? Observations in general? Certain facial Yes. We're talking about that. It's a lot. And I think that encompasses a lot of the micro expressions too. Is don't realize how much we can do. But just know that it means a lot. And it means a lot. Yeah. Sometimes the, the body movements are based on a body region or a habit. Yes. We lived in a part of the country where if you were on time, that was really rude. It was rude to be on time? Very rude. Okay. We're a social event. We're a social event. We show up on time. What region was that? South. Okay. In the South region, it's rude to be on time. Um, well, at least, you can't say, I can't say that all over the South. Right, right. Yeah, but in the real South. Yeah. Yes. Some cultures, I've heard that, um, like a wedding, when I got married, it's, I was expecting everybody to be on time, or a little bit early. You better be there before I'm coming down the aisle. <laughs> and we're starting pretty on time. So 
I've also heard that in other cultures or um, you know, ethnicities that it's practice for them to start hours late on a wedding for a wedding. This is all cultural, so we cannot generalize this to everybody. Okay, so to know that as well. And when you're inter uh, interacting, we have some cultural stuff on here too, but just know that when you're interacting with somebody else, mediating clients of your work, whatever, students, peers, depends on their culture. So what you think is very normal and okay might not be very nor normal or okay for them at all. Any other observations? The uh, micro expressions and some that you have no control over, they, they just happen as you react. What, what are your comments on that? If there's, there's no way to stop them, I think, because they are so, I mean, they're literally like a half a second things that happen. Right. So if you're, unless you're trained, you're not gonna kept, pick up on them. If you're being interrogated, you wanna be really careful with them because they're trained to look for those things and they can tell if you're lying or not based on those split second things, which is crazy to me. But how can you stop them? How can you regulate them? I don't think you really can. So that's my, that's my observations on that. Micro expressions are very interesting, but they just happen automatically and they just are. Any other observations? What are your observations on micro expressions? These crazy things that we do with our body that we don't realize that we do. I think you get an impression one person is lying and the other one's telling the truth, and what you don't realize is you process their micro. Mm -hmm. You might process them without even knowing. Mm -hmm. If you know that person for a long time, they build up and build up and build up. That's a good point. Anything else? I think they're the most difficult to detect, yeah. you know, unless you're trained. But yep. uh, I think they, they hold the key to. Uh, what is actually going on and what the other person is actually thinking. Key to the truth, yes. I think so. Uh-huh, I agree. I think they're mostly unconscious, too. Yeah. Like somebody said, <clears throat> on a good day, we can know what we're thinking or feeling on a good day. Yeah. But we never know what our body's doing unless somebody tells us. So if we can invite feedback, and I think that's one of the wonderful things about debriefing is and if mediators can get in the habit of telling each other, I noticed when that person said that, you would <laughs> you can never know you did that, or, or something much more subtle. But that we can help each other grow if we can give each other that kind of feedback. Mm -hmm. That is huge. We can't see our own faces when we're talking, when we're standing. So we don't know if we're, we look mad or roll, we're rolling our eyes. I used to be really bad at rolling my eyes and looking mad all the time. And I had no idea. I was feeling just fine. And people would always say, what's wrong with you? Why, why are you upset? What do you mean I'm not upset? I'm just fine. So I, did, I learned that my, my natural face, I guess, is just mad. <laughs> Some of us have that. So if that's the case, I had to work really hard because I didn't want people to, I knew I was going into teaching. How can I teach and make my students or anybody else that I'm interacting with feel like I'm mad all the time? Like, I don't want that impression of myself. And I don't want my students to feel like they can't come to me. So that was back in high school. I've had to work really hard with retraining my face to be happy. That sounds ridiculous, but it had to happen. So how did I do that? I literally sat down to whatever I was thinking about it. Okay, what do I think my face looks like right now? I didn't carry around a mirror all the time, which I probably should. That would have been helpful. But I just had to think about what does my face look like? Maybe I'm frowning a little bit, so just smile more or open my eyes more or something. So I think I'm a little bit Sometimes I, people say I'm a little bit too happy now. So I'm like, what do you want from these people? <laughs> Can't do anything right. But I'd rather be a little bit more happy than what's wrong with you? Why are you angry all the time? There's an interesting <clears throat> um, study on the radio yesterday talking about African American men, and they called it the clutch and move. Like, it, it, it's so exhausting to try to project that I'm not a, a threat mm -hmm. um, for many African American men. <coughs> that oftentimes when they'll step into the elevator, people will clutch and move. Um, and that, I think that is that kind of microaggression. And you can train yourself to no, change. Yeah. You can. It takes a long time. This does not happen overnight. I think I still have some things to worry about. If I'm just sitting by myself, I think I still kind of look mad. 
but when I'm interacting with people, I'm a lot better. But that's a great point. That's a great point. <clears throat> I was watching a trial yesterday when the prosecutor was pacing back and forth, walking up to the witness stand and walking back and turning her back to the witness and the judge. And I thought, that is the most arrogant, annoying thing. Mm -hmm. And I bet she's been doing it for 30 years. No, but she doesn't even know, probably, well, what it seems like. It could be. That's exactly what she wants. Or that, that too. Wants to, <clears throat> wants to, mm -hmm. wants you to yeah, ask yourself, how do I want other people to perceive me? Do I want them to perceive me as arrogant or angry? Or do I want them to per per um, perceive me as open and inviting and we can have a conversation and be friends? That's something else to ask yourself. As a prosecutor, that might have been her intentions. We don't know for sure. But that's a good point, too. Uh, I used to be practicing with a judge that would stop an attorney from doing that. Oh. He'd say, stand behind the lectern and don't get out from there. Mm -hmm. And that really, when the attorney was forced to stand there, it just blew up their death. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how, yeah. how, what do I do with myself? That's a good point. That is a good point. They're probably so used to doing it for so long that it's just like... It's hard. It's just really hard. <clears throat> and a lot of these things that we do, they're, they're habits. If you say um a lot, I have, uh, this is just a side note, in my classes in public speaking, if we work on ums, and it's one of my biggest pet peeves, I say um, we all say um, they're not going to be eliminated, eliminated completely from your dialogue, but oh, I give them an impromptu speech topic, so like random, apples, trains, whatever, on a note card, have them choose them randomly, and they say, okay, get your thoughts together, and then when you come up and give your presentation, it doesn't have to be anything formal or anything, it's just whatever comes to your brain. Every time you, they say, um, the class claps, and then they have to start over until they can get through their whole speech without saying, um. Some of them are mortified. I would be mortified too if I was in their position, but they get so much out of it. Oh my gosh, I didn't realize that I said um so much. Um is another nonverbal, well, I guess the verbal thing that you do that conveys not, you're not confident, right? You're not prepared. So that's something that to be really aware of as well. What's your hand up, Barbara? Oh, I was just going to say that when I was, um, <laughs> practicing, <sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> when, when I was practicing, in the hospital and I was taking care of small children, it was very interesting to me. Sometimes the kids would say, um, why, why are you looking like that? Or why are you, I, might, I would walk in and say hello, and they would say, why are you looking like that? that would all, that's all they would say? That's right. Mm -hmm. What do you think that means? Well, they were afraid of me. That's what I think. <laughs> okay. All right. Not all of them, but certain certain That's a good thing to be aware of because I would, if somebody were scared of me, I would want to know that, right? So small children really do have. I mean, we're we're not mediating small children, obviously, but small children have these and any that um, are very sensitive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, I'm going to say that. Everyone has the, you know, has the sensitivity, but they're, uh, they have no filter, mm -hmm. first of all. So the small kids you should split it out. Mm -hmm. And then as we grow up, we also um, end up listening less to those little noises, you know, the instincts and things like that. Yeah. We're able to separate it, and kids don't. Or ignore it. Or ignore it. Yeah. yeah. John? I had a situation with a, a boss that uh, only wanted to hear good news. So when, when you went down the wrong path, he'd be behind his desk. And the nostrils would flare up, and it was almost like a cartoon character because literally you could see the steam coming out of, it, out of his ears. You know. But I knew it's like retreat. Uh -huh. <laughs> Quickly, he said, "Well, you know, maybe we can look at it this way. You know, yeah. it's like get off the subject quickly." That's good. You're able to adapt who you're talking to. You knew that of him, so you knew how to react to it okay. rather than staying in his face. Right. Okay. Yeah, you don't want to do that. Other observations. Go for it. 
in regard to uh, expressing feelings and so on through your voice and the tone, there's a uh, lesson that people teach receptionists that they want to have them smile on the telephone. Mm -hmm. So they recommend putting a mirror by the station so they can look and see what, uh, how they're projecting their voice. In regard to reading emotions, I think it's a lot easier to read a dog, for instance, than it is for people. You know, if they're wagging their tail, it's probably one way. And uh, in looking at people and seeing emotions, some of us can uh, project our emotions a lot easier than others. We used to have a judge in the area, and any time he'd get upset, the red would start at his neck and move all the way up with his head, and you knew that was happening, you better sit down. <laughs> Oh, one other thing on children. Children are difficult uh, in courtrooms and they're difficult in mediation. I think one useful technique is to see if you can't put yourself in a lower plane than the child so that you're not looking down on them. Mm -hmm. That's huge. That's a, that's a good point. So I'm going to say what I was going to say. Remind me about the physical di distance with that because I might forget again. So what I was going to say before was how many things does an, a smile mean? How many things does a, a wink mean? I'm a pretty happy person, like I've already mentioned. One day, I was walking into Washtenaw, just minding my own business, and there was a guy standing out, sitting outside. And I was, he was on the phone, and I just was walking, and I smiled at him, and I said, good morning. And you know, as soon as I, I was on my way, I just smiled, you know, whatever. Friendly hello. And when I did that, he put the food still on the phone, but he put it down, and he said something along the lines of, hey, how you doing? And he literally <laughs> followed me walking away, and it was the creepiest thing. But that's an example of how many stuff, things does a smile mean. He interpreted the smile differently in the hello, differently than what I intended it to be. So that's, that, what's that? What's the way I didn't wink at him, I just smiled and said hi. <laughs> the physical <clears throat> difference that, I'm sorry, what's your name? John. Boyd. Okay. Huh. A physical difference. So uh, an aggressive person, I always tell my students that if they're establishing that they want to be dominant over you, and this is nonverbal, they're going to stand above you. So if, I'm, if me and Sally are fighting, and I'm more mean than what I am, She's sitting and I'm standing. I'm literally talking down to her because I'm physically higher than her. This happens a lot with kids too. If you do that a lot, they feel really intimidated. They feel like they can't tell you how they feel or their opinions or whatever. And they're really shut down. So what I tell my students is if somebody is doing that to you, you stand up to it. You gotta know who you're talking to because if somebody's super aggressive, you don't know what they're going to do. They could hit you. But Stand up, or they should sit down so you guys are physically level eye contact. And that will decrease any defensiveness or fear or anger automatically. All right, so that's something to think about. You could also do this in mediation. If somebody starts to stand up, have them try your best to have them sit down because they're trying to establish that dominance, and that's not okay. Right? All right, good. So style. Well, maybe if they're if they're yelling at each other and you want to establish your dominance, you might stand yes. up. Yes, and then you and stand. You can stand up and say something quiet, and yeah. still is speaking with authority. Yep, absolutely. <clears throat> yeah, this came up in a mediation recently that some of us were involved in, and one of the a lot of people and one of the men stood up and started walking like back facing forth the room. along the room and yelling at the people on the other side and. What we, when we were debriefing later, we thought that's the whole thing then spun out of control totally, but we thought that was really a critical point where we should have stopped everything and gotten him to sit down, mm -hmm. sit back down. We're asking if he'd like to go in the corridor if he needs to stretch his legs. <laughs> yes, that would, that would be good too, but, but somehow to get him equal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Isn't it amazing how just that stance, the, the height of your body, means so much? So interesting. Okay, so let's move on to the styles of expression. These are some things, just some terms, I guess, that uh, I think researchers use to explain what your face looks like. 
the withholder. So you may be part of many of these. You may know somebody who's part of these. And if mediation needed recently, you may also be able to apply these things. The withholder is the person that you want to strive to be when you're a mediator. You need to be able to as, be as neutral as possible. Don't show your feelings. So this person seldom sh um, shows facial movements at all. This is literally, we call it stonewaller. So if you are talking to somebody, asking them a question or whatever, and they literally are just looking forward, nothing on their face, that's a stonewaller or a withholder. It means it's a stone that's called stonewaller because it literally feels like you're talking to a wall because there's nothing there. The revealer style shows all emotions on the face. So this is where they're just changing second by second, depending on what you're talking about. If you're talking about something happy, they're automatically changing to a smile. If, you talk, if you're talking about something sad, uh, suddenly they're automatically going to a frown. So they're very revealing with their emotions. The unwitting expressor thinks they're good at masking, but they still show emotions. So you think you're being a neutralizer or a withholder or a stonewaller, but you're still smiling a little bit, grinning, or you might want to giggle out or, or something. You feel like you're good at masking that stuff, but you're really not. Substitute expressor is when you substitute one, ex one emotional expression for another. So this is when you think that you're showing happiness, but the other person sees disgust. This is probably what my problem was when I, people always told me that I was mad, mad or mean. I thought I was showing either neutral emotions or happy emotions, and apparently I was not. They were saying something very different. So that is a substitute expressor. The blanked expressor has an emotion of neutral facial expression, even when they think they're showing some emotion, or the same kind of thing. They think they're smiling, but other people see no, no response. So the substitute expressor was that they see, they see some kind of emotion, probably the opposite of what you're attending. And then the blinked is you think you're, you're smiling, but there's nothing. The frozen effect expressor, one emotion is frozen on somebody's face. So we've all been told some surprising news, and we've been, and we've stayed there. That's the frozen effect expressor. You don't want to do this in mediation. It's bad news. Okay. Ever ready is where you display one particular emotion in response to almost any situation. I have a, an aunt who, no matter what you're talking about, well, unless you're really sad. If you're really sad, she's like, oh, no, I'm so sorry. Like, very over dramatic about it. But most of the time, when you're talking about something just whatever or something happy, she's, oh my gosh, that's so amazing, or she's, oh, ha, 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 ha. And I'm thinking, okay, it's not that funny. You know, why are you, you know, kind of be that dramatic about what I'm talking about? That's the ever ready. Flooded effect uh, never appears neutral. One extreme emotion often appears, so that could also go under the flooded effect of my aunt. Okay, so those are the styles of nonverbal communication. Questions on that? Observations on that? Go for it. And you can help me out and tell me what it means. Uh, my wife gave me a shirt that says, I am smiling. <laughs> <laughs> so which one would you fall under? Probably. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Blank expressor, you think you're smiling, but others see no expression at all. <laughs> yep. So I'm on, yeah, you're not the only one, Tom. Sometimes you can be so far off in how you interpret something. If you're talking to people and they're nodding their head to you, both times you think, oh boy, you're right with me. Sometimes it means I know right where you're going with that, you know. Mm -hmm. you're not, Isn't it amazing you're not how when you're, me. when you're talking to somebody and they're, yeah, mm -hmm. they're saying all the right things, doing all the right gestures, but then you ask them, what did I just say? And they're like, oh, uh, I don't know what you just said because I wasn't listening. It's amazing how I think that that happens. They, they, that's called pseudo listening, where you they're acting like they're listening, they, they're looking at you, they're nodding, they're smiling, they're doing the uh-huhs, all the prompted, right prompting stuff, but they're really not listening to you. They could be, but a lot of times they're not. That's frustrating. You know, sometimes the, uh, <coughs> you know, the thing is the discussion is really a, a, an argument. Mm -hmm. And when, when you're discussing something, you're listening to the other person. When you're arguing, you're phrasing, you're, you're 
putting together your response and your, yes. your thinking ahead, not really listening. Absolutely, and that's a really big problem too. And that's what happens a lot in mediation, where we're like, this is a very safe, neutral environment. Everybody can have their say. We're all going to have a great discussion. And then the one person talks, and they're starting to shake their head. Mm -hmm. They're lying, right? You can see it on their face. And then they're yeah, they're not listening to to them at all. That's why, because they're forming their argument as they speak. Something that I heard in, in grad school, somebody said therapists use this, and I kind of feel like I want to use it with my students sometimes. We would love to use it in mediation, where they have a stick, it's literally like a stick, and some, of them, some therapists decorate it, and they give the stick to one person first. So if, I have, if me and Alan are having an argument, or I meet in therapy for whatever reason, we're disagreeing, I have the stick first, and the therapist says, okay, Danielle, how do you feel about whatever's going on? So I say that I'm frustrated with Al because he doesn't do the dishes and he doesn't take the garbage out when I ask him to. Whatever. Okay. It. So I they get we physically give the stick to Al. Al, what did Danielle just say? She said I'm a lazy piece of crap. Danielle, is that what she said? No. Give me back the stick. Danielle, what did you just say? I'm frustrated with Al when he does not do the dishes and when he doesn't take the garbage out when I ask him to. Give the stick back to Al. Al, what did Danielle say? She said, I don't listen. <laughs> Danielle, is that what you said? Nope. Give me back the stick. So you keep doing it however long it needs to end. If we did this in mediation, we'd be there forever, probably sometimes. But it's a good thing because we need to be able to paraphrase correctly. And a lot of times that's what happens is you're internalizing what the other person is saying as an attack, right? I never said that Al was lazy or a piece of crap. I was just basically saying that I was frustrated with him for these two reasons. So until he can say literally word for word, almost what I said is when that process will stop. What do you think about that? Do you think it's effective? Do you think it's a waste of time? Interesting. Well, I think it touches on the subject of reframing, mm -hmm. which is what mediators are trained to do uh, without the stick. So it's more along the lines of um, redirecting the statement so that you don't parrot it, but you try to rephrase or reframe the statement so that it can open up further discussion and that it's not just like, for example, you play the music way too loud and it, disrupt, it, it disrupts my sleep. You're on the fourth floor, I'm on the third floor, the noise comes down. Mm -hmm. So a way of reframing, reframing that is not to directly challenge the other person to play the radio too loud, just saying that, well, you know, we have some issues of uh, scheduling where the person on the third floor you know, works the late shift and hence needs as much sleep as possible. And, you know, how would you resolve that, you know, knowing that you have different schedules? So, in a way, that's almost what we do. Yep, yep. Sometimes I think it's that, that person who, like Al, is, he's got a filter there. He's not really, it's not that he doesn't want to listen. There's something else going on. Right, yeah. And, and there's probably a deeper issue here than the, than the dishes. Mm -hmm. And so if you feel that, then it might be helpful to kind of ferret that out. Yeah, and we don't know what's happened uh, this whole, the whole time up until this point. Yeah. The person, I could have called Al lazy and a piece of crap multiple times in our relationship for many years. So now he's just internalized that he's lazy and a piece of crap, right? So that's why he keeps saying that. That's probably what happens a lot. It's also important, I'll get you, I'm sorry, before I forget. It's important to remind me, I don't know if you want to remind them, but it's important to, in, in, in your relationships, Att if you're going to attack anything, attack the behavior that's being done, not the person. Okay, so I'm frustrated, like I said, I'm frustrated because of the dishes and the garbage. That's attacking or addressing the behavior, not L. But he's internalizing it as that. What's that? It's not, never take garbage. Right. Never say never, never say always, because there's always going to be that one time where they're like, oh, I... Really? I never do the dishes? Well, I did them a month ago. <laughs> so you can't say that because it's like, yeah, I guess you did do it a month ago. So it's not 
always or never. Go for it. Um, I was going to say that that scenario also reminds me of the mediation when you're really helping people to disentangle impact from intent. Mm -hmm. So I think what he's saying is he, you know, he's, the impact, the way it makes him feel, he's then saying, well, that was her intent, even though she's saying, no, I just made a statement that was not my intent. Mm -hmm. So I think that the stick is you know, the same way you said reframing. Egocentric as a society, so we're really worried about ourselves, not a, too much about anybody else. So, based on what you say to me, it must be that you're attacking me. So, that's something to think about, too. Anything else? Go for it. Um, you had said that our goal as uh, mediators is to have a little older style of expression, and overall, I can understand that in terms of. You can do this. And also, it feels like one of the things we need to do is to help people feel welcome and respected. And so there, there is room for some emotional expression, I think. Yeah. Yep. And that's going to kind of come out in my slides that are coming up. But yeah, you have to pay attention to, as the to your body language as the mediator because you're communicating to these two people or more people who are in the room if you are open or not. Just based on your, look at the way you're, you're sitting right now. Don't move, just look at the way you're sitting. What is, that, what is that saying about you? It's saying something. How do you feel based on how you're sitting? Or what do you think it conveys? So if you're leaning forward, do you think that suggests maybe that you're interested? Mm -hmm. Generally. Generally, yeah. Mm -hmm. If you're leaning back, sometimes, I assume everybody is super interested in what we're doing right now. <laughs> but if you're leaning back, what does that convey generally? Mm -hmm. I do this a lot, and I've, I've done it this whole time probably. I have a problem with that. It's just something that I've always done. I'm a very introverted person, so naturally I'm just shy. So I just like to close myself off. This says something too, that when you're not very open to, and I'm not intending that to be conveyed, but that's what that means. So I need to be aware to open my arms a little bit and be more open, I guess, to them. So the thing, the little thing, even those little things, you're not intending to communicate that, but you are or you could be to somebody, if that's how they decode your message. Okay. So I was thinking it was kind of the person responsible for setting up the brown bag lunches, that my posture is turned this way rather than this way. Yeah. <laughs> that's sort of interesting. Mm -hmm. like yeah. So you're more engaged with the group rather than just me. Mm -hmm. You have thoughts on hearing the actions of the Speaker and where they're putting their hands to lean forward or back and so on. Do I have thoughts on mirroring, mirroring that stuff? So I do think that if maybe if I'm the mediator and you're the one of the parties who are there and I'm like this and I'm leaning back and I'm kind of like looking around, not giving much eye contact, you're probably going to do the same to me naturally just because that's what I'm doing to you. So if I'm closed off, you're going to close yourself off maybe too. It's conveying that I'm not interested, maybe, in what you're saying, or that I don't really care. So you're going to be, whatever, I don't care about this either. Right? Same thing with the parties. If the parties, if one party starts yelling, the para language, is the other party going to start yelling too? Mm -hmm. Yep. So they're mirroring their behavior too. So it doesn't always happen, but a lot of times it does. And that's why it's important to pay attention to what your body looks like too when you're interacting with people. So I'm new to this and I haven't done any work here, but I do a lot of facilitation work. Mm -hmm. and, and we're trained if we see someone do this and back up to then make the observation, I, I see what you're doing, describe it, and say, what, and would you be willing to share what's going on? Do you do, you do that in mediation? When you're, when you're not getting someone from to, 
engage, I guess, would be. Last thing, what do you guys do? What would you guys do in that situation? Would you pay attention? Would you make note verbally of that behavior, or would you just let it go? Well, a lot of times, I mean, from my experience, we have a ground rule generally that we set that, you know, when one party's speaking, you know, you could just be respectful and, and, and kind of wait your turn, basically. So a lot of people will sit there and listen to that party, but like, I really don't want to hear this, and they need that. And then they know they're going to get their chance if they can keep quiet. <laughs> and then they'll, they'll kind of you know, say what they're going to say. So I haven't really found it to be where they usually just sit there and agree because okay. they're just steaming and thinking about what they're going to say sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, but they'll be closed off because they just disagree with what they're saying and you know, waiting their turn. But. And a lot of times in mediation, you need to uh, you're allowing both parties to speak. And when they get to mediation, they have a hard, they probably haven't had this chance to talk about anything civilly until the moment they're with you. So maybe to, and I could be wrong here, but to make note of the little things that they're doing might just open something up that you don't really want to talk about at that moment. So just let them be mad and whatever, and closed off. And then when they talk, they'll open up a little bit more. The other person might close off to you because they're both mad at each other with your guts. So mm -hmm. I'm not going to act like I like you right now, but that's just my observation, Craig. Yeah, in the context of mediation, another response to that might be, oh, I see they're not really engaging or not willing to engage. Maybe it's time for a caucus to be able to talk with them one-on-one, -on -one and they'd be more willing to then let you know what's really going on. Yeah, or also, I think we've done, I think that we've seen really aggressive behavior on the part of one party, and it's just not being productive, you know, to kind of separate them. So it's kind of a different scenario where you don't always have to have the people you know, facing each other and kind of dealing with their non-verbal cues and kind of, you know, again, we might separate caucus to keep the facilitation going in a more productive way, you know. And I don't know if you've ever been this mad at somebody, but sometimes you get so mad at somebody, just the sight of them throws you into a rage. So you're going to do all those things that you wouldn't normally do. That's why caucuses are so important. John, was your hand up? Said, uh, okay, Diane. We had two people in a mediation once and they had two totally different styles of communication. And so we just pointed out to each of them, their styles were different. Right. And it was a long game right? Mm -hmm. Things started happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people don't understand that there are different styles of communication. If you, don't, if you don't communicate the way I communicate, something's wrong with you. That's not the case. <laughs> Well, you know, in mediation, obviously one party is there uh, in a more defensive posture than the other, and consequently you have to anticipate a different tone from a person who is uh, the aggressor as to who would be the plaintiff, as opposed to the defendant who is defending, and they would have a, perhaps a more uh, defensive tone. Mm -hmm. uh, probably the trick is for the uh, mediator to have that vanilla neutrality, which is uh, often misunderstood by the parties. Uh, so sometimes they come to mediation expecting much more from the mediator than we are really allowed to, or want to give them. And of course that requires us to explain a little more carefully mm -hmm. what our role is. To set the record straight, by the way, Al does load the dishwasher. Okay. <laughs> we know that. <laughs> Thanks, for, Thanks for clarifying that. But you yeah. <laughs> Does she reload it when I reload it? That's so funny. Yeah, I was just going to say too that um, I've been, you know, you're, you're the content expert here and you can tell me differently, but although there is, I think, innate communication methods we all have, right, that we're kind of born with, I think a lot of communication is learned behavior. Yeah. And so, um, you know, some people just don't communicate well because they really just don't know how. And so I found that it's really important as the role of mediators that reframing, you know, to help you know them maybe truly communicate what they're trying to communicate, and that can also be that log jam breaker of you know getting the parties to kind of understand each other and, and try to work towards some kind of resolution. But helping yeah. them you know just reframe it in a way that the other party can really understand. Yeah, and they might be, they might walk away from mediation and say, "Wow, I never really thought of it that way. Or I never really even thought about the way I communicate. Maybe I am the problem." There was a problem in the situation, so now they're able to be friends again and get along and not sue each other. Yeah, I like 
I like that. That's a good point. So much, especially in my, with my students, and I always refer to them just because I spend so much time with them, but I think they, they relate to you guys as well. They say, well, my mom and dad fought all the time. My, my dad was, was an abuser or was never around or whatever. So they feel like since their dad was the abuser, if they're the son, that they have to be just like their dad. And I tell them, I'm able to you know, give more advice and stuff in class, but I tell them, you're not bound to how you were raised. You don't have to be like your parents are or were. You can learn to be different. I'm a very introverted person, very, very shy in high school. I think it was a def the mad look was a defense mechanism. If I looked mad all the time, you're not going to approach me, so I didn't have to worry about it. So that became a problem later on in my life, but I've learned to be much more outgoing. So yes, that's an absolute. There are some things that are innate, innate in you, you're born with. I will always be shy to an extent, but you're able to learn how to change a little bit and be more effective. That's a great point. Back to Al, what he said is we have to be neutral facilitators and we can't give advice or anything. They so often come to mediation, just tell me what to do, give me an answer. And they get frustrated because you don't give them an answer, you can't give them an answer. So that adds to the anger, the frustration, but I think you do a great job of staying neutral and they're happier when they're able to come with, up with their own solutions. Then if it fails, if you tell them what to do, and it fails, they can't come back on you and say, well, you told me what to do, and that's why I failed, because I didn't come up with it myself. These rules for eye contact that I have on here, this is so interesting. This, if there's a video on here, if you just Google Dan O'Connor on YouTube, or well, YouTube Dan O'Connor, and then put in eye behavior or eye contact, this video is very informal, but it is hilarious. So, he says that, this is where I did write down my notes, so, technological difficulties. He says that, oh my gosh, so funny. So, he says that with eye, behavior, with eye contact, is huge. So, he goes off and does like these consulting things and presentations and teaches on this. He said, one person came up to him and said, that, and there's multiple things, but he says don't be a creeper, basically, when you give eye contact. My students, I am astounded at how often my students say, I don't like eye contact. Getting a presentation, don't look at me, I'd rather you not. But I would rather you do look at me because it's showing that nonverbal communication that you're interested in what I'm saying. But, I mean, the younger generations, I don't know what it is, I don't know if it's technology or what, that's an argument, but they are so uncomfortable with interaction and, and eye contact. It's kind of scary sometimes. So this guy says that this person came up to him and said, some people are just, I, they don't want to talk to me. They, they shy away from me. They say that I'm intimidating. And he says that her eyes are really big. She's like, I don't know why people think this of me. I'm just like, happy, I'm a nice person, and he's like, well, maybe you should close your eyes a little bit, and they'll be a little bit more, welcome. you'll be a little bit more welcoming. Do you know anybody like that? Their eyes are so big, and they're just like, staring at you. <clears throat> I had a work situation where I was that person, but I was communicating regularly with somebody from the Caribbean, and I realized one day that part of our problem was that her listening style was to go, oh, which drove me insane. And my listening style was to stare intently and say, I am with you, I am with you. <laughs> so I tried to do a little bit more uh -huh, and text a little bit. Mm -hmm. He also says that seven to 10 seconds is the appropriate time to give eye contact. So when somebody's talking to me, I think that I give them more eye contact when I'm the listener than the speaker. If I'm the speaker, I look away every once in a while, but I still look at you when I'm speaking. Seven to ten seconds, does that seem like a long time to maintain the eye contact with the person? It does seem like a long time. It does seem like a long time. Let's, I have my students do this, I do not make you guys do this. I have them find a partner and look at them for ten seconds and I count. So let's just sit for ten seconds and we'll see how long that feels. Okay, start now. Thank you. 
advising. <laughs> That's kind of a long time, right? But any longer than 10 seconds, it's getting pretty weird and <laughs> so that's just a rule of thumb that he says. When you do break the eye contact, look to the side rather than down. Whenever you look down, it makes you look like you're not confident in what you're doing or saying. All right, so look off to the side when you're talking to people rather than down. Up, it is conveying that you are trying to think of what you're gonna say next. So to the side, and it's just breaking eye contact, just so you're not staring at the person the whole time. Look into the side, look to the sides. Look back when you make more eye contact with someone, or lean back when you're making eye contact with somebody who you do not know. Just because you don't want to make somebody feel uncomfortable. I didn't try to know Sally, and we were both, hi Sally, how's it going? That'd be weird sometimes to people, okay, if you did not know them. So if you're going to give them more eye, eye contact, just lean back a little bit, not too much where you're super comfortable and you're going like to take a nap, but just lean back a little bit so you're not making them feel like you're dominant and staring them down. So that is what Dan O'Connor says. I hope you guys watch that video because it's very interesting. Culture is huge depending on who we talk to, and I are, I've already said that anything, any of the things we've talked about today, we can't generalize this to everybody, so you got to know who you're talking to. Culture is just socially what you think is important, what the norm is, right? So down south, I've found like Texas, Kentucky, in certain parts, they're much nicer down south. When you come up here, it's like everybody's super busy again and don't care about anybody else and rude, honking at horn. So that's called, we've got different cultures even in our own big culture in the United States, America. Latin Americans, Southern Europeans, and Arabs will look at you directly. Sometimes you don't know the back part of somebody, so just use your common sense, right? But this is just something to think about if you do know the, uh, the background. Northern, Northern Europeans, Indian Pakistanis, and Asians will look more in the peripheral gaze or no gaze at all. I had some students one time, well, I always have students, do this, but the first time I had an Asian student and he came to me and he was talking to me and I'm so used to eye contact, I value that, so I give people eye contact, but he was looking down the whole time, so he walked up to me like this, I'm like, okay, and he's talking to me like this, and I thought, why aren't you, why aren't you looking at me? Do not... He's showing respect. By mm -hmm. He is showing respect. But from a culture who did somebody from a culture who didn't realize that, I was thinking the opposite of, do you not respect me? Look at me, look at me when you're talking to me, right? So if you're aware of that, it just makes it much easier to communicate with people. This next slide is a couple of things that you can learn from high context versus low context cultures. High context cultures. Pay attention to nonverbal stuff or what's going on around you more than what you say. So how you say something, verbally or nonverbally, is much more important than what you say. So um, just be aware of this, just in general. This SCAD fish that I have here, this acronym, these are the culturally universal emotions. <coughs> So scat fish, sadness, content, anger, disgust, fear, interest, surprise, and happiness. They say that all of these are the same, no matter what culture you're in. But some cultures will use these differently in certain situations. So some people might laugh in nervous when they're nervous. So that might be complimentary to you. <coughs> Why are you laughing when you should not be? Okay, this situation is not funny and you're laughing. So just be aware of the culture again. And then this last slide was that TED Talk. She really just talks about your body language. She asks you to look at the way your body looks uh, right now. And what does that say about you? And then how in job interviews, leadership positions, anything that you're in, basically, in a personal relationships, it kind of depends on how successful you are. Go to a job interview and don't look at the interviewer at all. 
or have a weak handshake, and good luck getting the job. Right? So nonverbal communication is very important in all aspects of your life. So check that video out. Are there any questions, comments, observations about today? I just wanted to make a comment about the laughter. Um, I had two separate occasions, two separate companies, where I was being introduced to a new boss. And in one case, it was uh, the boss that was two layers above my boss. And in both situations, I was laughing nervously because they said, how are your numbers looking? And I said, oh, they look great, you know. And, you know, but the, the, they interpreted that I was laughing at them. Yes. And it got really, really tense because they ended. Two separate companies, years apart, different people, but they both confronted me. They said, what the hell are you laughing about? Thinking I was laughing at them. And I said, look, um, I'm not in a position to laugh at you, first of all, <laughs> you know, because you're the boss. I said, but it's just, maybe I'm a little nervous, first time meeting you, da, da, da. but it's amazing. Mm -hmm. that, uh, and they, they did turn out to be extremely insecure people. That's the other qualifier that I learned over time, you know, so they, they took it very personally that I was challenging them, which I was not. Right. I was just like, you know, I don't want to be here any more than you do. Right. <laughs> but, anyway. That's a great point. But it happened. It, it happens a lot. It happens so much. And just the, the comment, uh, communication is so important. We know that. Communication is so important. When we assume things about somebody else, that's when conflicts rise. So for them to say, why are you laughing? It opened up the communication of, well, that's not what I was intending. I'm sorry, you know, whatever. And they felt fine immediately, right? Pretty much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they let it go. Yeah. But they could have held, held on to that and thought John is oh, yeah. rude I mean, and I'm supposed to a really bad start with these two new ones. <laughs> <laughs> nice recovery. Nice recovery. Laughter is an interesting emotion and it can express a lot of different things. For instance, at a funeral, some people when they feel grief will laugh. From my personal observation, I think women laugh a lot more than men do. Mm -hmm. And uh, laughter can can express all sorts of different feelings. Yeah, yeah. All of these things can. We can, we cry because we're happy. We cry because we're sad. We cry because we're scared. Right? Cry All because we're mad. We cry because we're mad. Yeah. We laugh because we're scared. We laugh because we're happy. We smile at people because we want to be nice. We smile at people because we're attracted to them. Right? We mean so, we, everything means so much. So that's why communication verbal is ambiguous. Nonverbal communication is much more ambiguous because you don't know the intentions of the other person. That's the importance of text messaging and emoticons. <laughs> right? How many times have you taken a text message the wrong way? Bad news. Emails, same way, if you don't text. Tom? Don't smile at a police officer. When these officers talking to you, a smile is a challenge to his authority or her mm -hmm. authority. Mm -hmm. You're not taking this seriously. I'm not your friend. Yes. That's a good point. That video that I was talking about, eye contact, he compares it to dogs too. So if you have a dog, go home and look at them in the face. So hold their face. Look at them in their face. And if they're looking to the side, that means that they're showing you that you're dominant. I have a 10 pound Yorkie, and then when I watched that video, I went home and I was like, yeah, I'm going to test this. I looked at him, he was staring back at me. And I was like, you little dog. So that was not what I was expecting. But that's what happens. <laughs> that's what happens with eye contact. So if you are maintaining the eye contact, that means that you're not going to, you know, skimper away and be scared. You're going to hold your own. So that's a good point. If you are talking to somebody with high authority, laughing, a lot of eye contact. But also, it could, could, could depend. If you're giving eye contact, it could communicate to them that you're paying attention to them and you are taking them seriously. If you're looking around, like, yeah, whatever, that could be what they're interpreting too. So you just gotta be careful. Yes? To go back to the neutral facial expression uh, as a mediator, I have a lot of trouble with that. And I remember in training, they gave us a ditto what you should look like when you're listening. And there were like, 50 identical faces on it. Yeah, just, and I know yeah. that if I was in mediation as a client um, and the person just had this absolute deadpan look, 
I don't think I'd like it. And I'm wondering, I mean, there are often, there's often more than one way to deal with something. And to give you a, a silly example here, but France um, is very proud of its secularism. And there is no religion allowed in public schools in France. Um, in, in Britain, they also don't want to favor one religion over another. So that in all the public schools, any religion is allowed, and the government subsidizes those schools, be they Islamic or Catholic or whatever. So it's like two ways of showing the government doesn't really care about your religion, in a sense, doesn't want to discriminate. And I wonder with this facial expression, if, if there's another way, if, I don't know what it is, I mean, I guess I just try to look really interested in what people are saying mm -hmm. uh, to both sides. And, and I'm sure I don't do this perfectly because I do give away my emotions. But I'm wondering if interest could be a substitute for blankness. And I'd like to ask people what they do. What do you do? I, I definitely... Um, I think I try anyway to convey interest, but to both parties equally. Mm -hmm. So that's what I think that's I what do. I try to do. Yeah, I mean, try to do. You know, it's hard, but yeah, because I, I think just with the blank stare, it looks like, are they even here with me right now? Mm -hmm. You know, so um, I just try to convey that I'm interested in hearing both sides equally as I as I can. Anything else that you would do different? Well, one of my professors wrote a book called Beyond Neutrality, and his contention is that. There's no such thing. It's impossible to be neutral. There's no such thing as neutrality. Um, his name is Bernard Mayer, or Bernie Mayer. And he says that there's four roles that the uh, mediator assumes, whether you're conscious of this or not. But they're, um, you're an ally, you're a strategist, you're an organizer, and a coach. And you know people can argue with that. They can say, oh, that's ridiculous. You know, that's nonsense. But I have found that despite the position of neutrality, in many cases, you can't help but start to see one side versus another. You can't help it. I mean, I know we try to steer a neutral course, but then it's just a question of whether or not you jump into those four roles. You may only jump into one of them. Because when you go into caucus, you know, conceivably, you could be the strategist. I've had this happen where um, one lady said, I've never negotiated in my life. I don't know how to do it. So. On, just on a very basic uh, level, you know, I, I tried to teach her some rudimentary forms of negotiation. I just gave examples, okay? So I'm, I'm going into that role of a strategist now. I might say, well, you know, if she asked for my help and I'm offering it, blah, blah, blah. But um, I, I do think there is some merit to that, that, um, you know, as we progress as mediators, um, you know, and I don't want to sound like I'm a, uh, uh, I'm trying to say, preaching hypocrisy, shall we say, or, or deviation from, you know, the, the religion of mediation. But I, I do feel that that is true to a large extent. You know, I don't go in looking for it, but it, it somehow it does evolve. So I, I think probably the best thing, if you, if you Google him, Bernie Mayer, Bernard Mayer, you'll probably, you know, come up with his, his theses and his points of view that I think are interesting to lend themselves to <coughs> another side of the neutrality discussion. He's a very distinguished professor and it's just he has a different way of looking at it. Because he says, well, you know, we all have to anticipate the needs of the participants, but they actually are looking for more from the mediator as opposed to, you know, the blind stare, which I know we don't do with all the time, but, but they do look for us to become more engaged. So there are subtle ways to do it without prejudicing or showing that you have bias for either side. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think you, as a mediator, while I may be neutral, you also can be very helpful by being positive. <coughs> and, uh, because the ultimate resolution of, of this meeting is a positive resolution, if at all possible. And their, their body language and their tone uh, will reflect the positiveness as opposed to we're not going to win this thing. So the neutrality doesn't have to be more than like that's true. I've been interested, I, two years ago, uh, 
I took the uh, International Institute of Restorative Practices training, and their approach to mediation or facilitation is scripted, and you they specifically say to not do much of any eye contact in order to ever remain neutral to everybody, which was even if we didn't do the role plays was tricky to do and it, it was particularly interesting because if you watch the instructor, they don't really do that. Um, so I I find the description very useful in terms of you have the four actually I think all four roles are mutually supportive of being an ally strategist, organizer, and coach. Um, you can do that for every you can do that for, for all parties. Sometimes you do a little more of one than the other. Uh, I, just, I just find that I would have to figure out because it's going to be very useful. I thought. What I do is, and you have to be, you have to stay true to who you are too. So I'm a very smiling person, and I've had people say, "Oh, we're smiling today," and I'm like, "Yeah, you know, we're just happy, right?" I'd rather, "Hey, how's it going? My name's Danielle. I'm your your mediator," rather than John Smith, Mary Brooks. We're going down here, right? To stay neutral, just no feeling, emotion whatsoever. So if you're, as long as you're equal to both parties, no matter what you do, I think that's what I what I do. Sometimes again, people are like, well, if this is not a happy moment, why are you smiling at me? It's part of just my interest, right? I'll smile at both of you, or I'm, I'll nod at both of you. Sally, do you have any advice on this? I think that idea of being interested a really good one. I, I noticed it's one of the Scatfish Universal Emotions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. So interest it is. <laughs> Happiness it is. <laughs> Any other observations? Go for it. I'd add one, one additional uh, item to that list. I had a mediation a while ago and, and two parties that were unequal in the, in the respect that one attorney was a, one party was a very aggressive dominating attorney. And uh, in that type of situation, I think you have to be a referee. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's a great point. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we do have to be a referee. Anything else? You guys have been great today. We have five minutes left, so we went the whole time. You guys, great discussion. This was really fun. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, reminder, if you think that anything that I teach would be beneficial in the places that you work or whatever, I'm happy to meet with you after this and we'll discuss uh, what's going on. But I'd love to meet you. I'd love to work with you if you think that would be beneficial. So have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.